cannot get these lights to do anything here. Okay, um, today we're moving to Paris, and we won't ever completely get away from Italy since uh, Paris, um, actually France in general, had a very strong relationship during the Renaissance and late Renaissance with um, events and things in France, but um, nonetheless, that is where we're going. But before we go into the details of the city of Paris, uh, one of the great cities of the world, I believe, I think any discussion of Paris requires an understanding of its topography. Uh, if you understand the topography, you then understand uh, a great deal. It makes it a lot easier. So it took me 47 years to actually draw this map in PowerPoint, but I did it. And um, what you're looking at here, of course, is the Paris Basin. This is the Seine, and the river is flowing in this direction, in which it swoops down and comes way back around and, and goes out in the direction here to the north. North is up. Now, if you look at this, what you'll notice is that there are hills at the top. That is called Montmartre, another one here, and another one here. And thus, the, because the river is swooping around in different directions, uh, the conventional understanding of the city is left bank and right bank. Even to this day, people will say, well, where do you live? I live on the left bank or I live on the right bank. Uh, so this is the left bank and this is the right bank. And if you look at the topographic map, what you will see is that the right bank is essentially a floodplain because the course of the river at some point in time came around this way and bumped up into the harder rock that we see up here and then came down here in this sort of arc over the top that we see um, sort of in this, at the base of this hill right here. This will become a major issue um, in the history of the city, uh, both for its origins as the Roman city of Lutetia, but also in the 19th century because of the development on the right bank which today is the, one of the wealthier parts of the city, uh, constantly flooded. And it flooded because there were inadequate sewers. Um, the only sewers that existed uh, around 1800 were uh, the old Roman sewers that had been put in. And as a result, public health and disease became a real problem as the sewers on the right bank, when the sand flooded before they had uh, flood control upstream, uh, flooded, it flooded up above the sewers and backed all the water up into the streets. And as a result, you had things like hepatitis and E. coli bacteria and so forth floating around in the streets, in some cases to a depth of 30 inches. Um, that was exacerbated by the fact that if you didn't have a sewer, what did you have? You had a cesspit, meaning that um, the human waste simply went into a uh, pit that was in the basement or in a courtyard of the house, of the dwelling, um, most of which were apartment buildings of one sort or another, some, in some cases only one room apartments. And uh, when the water backed up, of course, it mixed all of that human waste with it and floated around all over the place in the street. Not very pleasant. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of our story except to um, point out that this topography plays a very important role. The Romans, pragmatists that they were, did not build on the right bank over here. They built, they never built really in the floodplain much, even though Rome itself flooded all the time, and that's one reason probably why they didn't. They built instead here on the left bank. Um, and uh, they built the city. There was actually a Celtic tribe living here called the Parisi, and they lived um, on the island in the middle of this island that we see, the big island, which is called the Island of the City or the Ile de la Cité. Um, the Romans, when they came in, uh, Julius Caesar in the first century before the Common Era, uh, they established uh, what was probably uh, a municipium, but it could have been a colonia. We don't know. Here on the right bank, on the left bank, rather, uh, on the hill, um, actually, uh, the, the city was known as Lutetia. Uh, 
Um, so the Roman city, uh, we know from fragmentary evidence that remains, we can plot more or less where, in fact, um, the ancient Cardo and Decumanus was, where the forum was, and we can overlay that today on the map of the city and trace to some degree, to a limited degree, trace its outlines. There was a large arena that was built over here. There was a bath complex built here. We know that the forum was here. And today, this is the Jardin de Luxembourg, and this is the Boulevard Saint-Michel. The Roman Cardo um, and its Cardine, its second uh, street that we see here, uh, emerged today and still exists as um, the Cardo as the Rue Saint-Jacques and the um, Cardine that we see as the Rue Saint-Martin, both of which crossed bridges and continued on uh, to the north uh, of the city. Now, interestingly enough, I should mention, because if you recall, the blocks of Olynthus were 300 feet. And um, that means they could be divided into five 60-foot units. Um, and likewise here, the spacing of these indicates, in fact, that we were working with a module of about 300 feet. That's an interesting um, little fact because the blocks of Savannah, Georgia are 300 feet. Now, when Oglethorpe laid out Savannah, he didn't have any idea what the blocks of Paris were. But there's something about the 60-foot increment that becomes critically important, I think, in the dimensions of cities because of its inherent flexibility to accommodate the widest possible variety of uses on the representational or economic side over time. There's a model here, sort of, uh, that has been constructed showing from the, uh, from the, um, what we know from the trace outlines of the city, uh, where the city was. We see the forum there in the center, uh, the cemetery out here on the right, and then we see the Rue Saint-Jacques crossing uh, the island and over there on the right bank before it headed north across Montmartre. There are points such as here where we see the outline of the Roman pomerium still, um, still embedded in the, in the street or in the pavement. And then this, looking down the Rue Saint-Jacques, down the Old Cardo with the Sorbonne, the University of Paris, on the left. And if we were to look at the crossing street right here, we would be at the decussis of Cardo and Decumanus. And then down here, just off the Boulevard Saint-Michel, um, or the baths of Cluny, which were converted into um, a variety of other uses in the Middle Ages and then eventually into what is called a hotel. Now, our word hotel means that you go across the street and you walk up to the desk and you put down a MasterCard or an American Express card and you rent a room for the night. That is not what a hotel means uh, in Paris. A hotel means a large house. In Italy, it would be a palazzo. Um, here, it is a hotel. And um, there were a series of these hotels that were built both within the carcass of the Roman buildings, but also on the right bank over here in an area known as the Marais, which will figure into our story. Marais is the French word for marsh. If we map this on uh, the city today, we can see that fairly clearly, actually. Um, this is the uh, saint jean de also known as the Pantheon, uh, it takes its name because it had a dome. It was designed by the architect Soufflo. The Ecole Polytechnique, by the way, is right here. This is the Jardin de Luxembourg right over here. And there are the Baths of Cluny just outside of the Pomerium of the city. The arena uh, was located outside of the Pomerium and uh, was excavated uh, back in the early part of the 20th, late, later part of the 19th and early part of the 20th century and uh, is there today. Okay. Uh, this is just a view of it in detail, and you can sort of squint your eyes a little bit, and you can begin to see, uh, again, the outlines of the pomerium, and then over here is the arena. Somewhere over here, there's an escarpment about right here that drops down, and as a result, um, the pomerium stayed up here on the high ground. Here is St. jean of Yves, and uh, this is actually the site of the Decumanus, and there we see, uh, I'm sorry, this is the Cardo 
that we see here, and the forum would have stood somewhere about right here. Um, really on the high point of the left bank. Now, um, after the uh, collapse of the Roman world in the West uh, and the Frankish invasions, um, also Burgundians and the Alemanni and all sorts of other um, tribes that moved in. These were Franks. And in the Middle Ages, um, this was, uh, Paris was controlled by a group of people uh, who were called Merovingians, Merovingians. And we see this um, city that, in fact, the Roman city, which is showing up still in trace outline here, had, in fact, has been abandoned. And they have moved back on to the island with the cathedral church of Notre Dame de Paris uh, constructed on the actual island. Uh, you'll also notice these two islands here. Uh, again, these are sort of sandbars because the river is moving in this direction. And uh, in part of our story today, we will see how these islands were then um, actually connected back to here, filled in, and one of the uh, royal pluses that would be constructed by Henry IV uh, right around the turn of the 1600s, 1500s to 1600s, uh, would in fact be constructed there. That is the Place Dauphine. Um, so in the um, 10th century, the city of Paris, very small, looked something like this. And it began to grow uh, under Philippe Auguste in the 12th century to the 13th century. And it would be Philippe Auguste who would um, actually construct the hunting park, which is just outside the wall above uh, the word Sen on the map, um, which we see as the Tower of the Louvre. Louvre actually is related etymologically to wolf, and this was apparently a hunting lodge that was constructed by the king sometime around uh, 1200 uh, of the Common Era. We also notice the walls here. Uh, these walls and the spaces that were at the base of those walls um, again, the Germanic word bulwark uh, comes into play. And when these walls came down as the city grew outward, they would eventually be replaced by uh, a French word, a boulevard, which is where our word boulevard actually comes from, the space at the wall in the circumferential, um, circumferential systems. And there we actually see along the wall here a space on the outside as the city began to grow here by the monastery of Saint-Germain, Saint-Germain-de-Pré. Um, we know from documents that there were about 10,000 people that were associated with the, the monastery, not living here, but on lands that were controlled by this very, very important medieval monastic foundation. Uh, it was integral, actually, to the school at Notre Dame, which created the University of Paris here in the so-called Latin Quarter. Uh, called the Latin Quarter, uh, not because it was filled with people from Latin America, but because they spoke Latin um, as the language of uh, the scholarship of, of, of the time and also of the church. This area that we see outside the wall becomes then the Faubourg. So Paris had developed into a burg, a burg, and um, thus on the outskirts here, the Faubourg Saint-Germain, and here, the Faubourg Saint-Honoré. We also see the temple constructed here, the Templars, the Knights Templars, uh, which we've already discussed, who are essentially the people who create, in the late Middle Ages, what emerges as our modern uh, banking system, depositing money here, going somewhere else, and being able to withdraw the same amount somewhere else, right, through this kind of global network. Uh, which happens every day, of course, on the stock exchanges and so forth around the world and in banks around the world, even when you travel. Um, this that you see here, of course, will become the Bastille here, which was a tower originally defending the rampart, but uh, eventually is used uh, as a prison. Now, keep in mind that everything that you see here on the right bank, this is the area here called the Marais, and everything that you see here on the right bank ultimately is subject to pretty bad flooding until you get up north outside of the city. 
Um, by the time of the Bourbon monarchs, the Bourbon monarchs, uh, those are the Louis, uh, but it begins with um, sort of the protagonist of our story today, a man who was actually originally from Spain named Henri, Henry of Navarre. That's the northern province of Spain. And uh, Henry ends up becoming the first, uh, sets up the Bourbon um, dynasty, the Bourbon monarchs, at the end of the religious wars of the 1500s. Um, France had been racked with uh, these internal civil wars between the Protestant elements and, and the Catholic elements, Roman Catholic elements. In fact, Henry um, actually converted from Catholicism to Protestantism and back to Catholicism twice. His famous quote was, what is a mass for a kingdom? <laughs> and uh, he really sets up uh, what becomes sort of the um, sequence of events that ultimately will lead to the consolidation of France, that, and France will emerge in the world as the first modern nation state. What do I mean by that? Everybody's speaking pretty much the same language. You have borders that pretty much conformed, except for the Alsace and Lorraine to the, to the east, which was part German around Strasbourg. You actually have um, everybody speaking a common language. You have borders that look pretty much like what it is today. You have a central administration and so forth, and that occurs under um, the Bourbon monarchs. Now, it wasn't a smooth transition. There were periods of time when um, there were riots and revolutions uh, that were squelched. Um, but the succession goes from Henry IV, uh, Henri IV, to um, his son, Louis XIII, and from Louis XIII to Louis XIV, from Louis XIV to the 15th, and then the 16th, who got his head cut off. Um, in 1789, 1791 actually, in, with the revolution of 1789, the French Revolution that ended the monarchy. It took 50 years to get rid of it completely, but ended the monarchy um, as a form of government in France. You can see here that the uh, city has grown outside of its uh, original sort of medieval walls. There we see the, the uh, space where the wall was. And uh, we notice the Louvre here, which was outside of the wall. And you'll notice that there's actually an extension of that, which is coming down and across here, called the Palais de Tuileries, the Garden of the Tuileries, uh, the palace uh, and the Tuileries that we see up here was a garden that was associated that will come into play on Friday. Um, today, however, what I want to focus on um, is what happens in the reign of Henry IV, the, the first Bourbon monarch. Um, he is um, secure. He is married to uh, a Medici, Marie de Medici, who is from Florence, who grew up in the Boboli Gardens, the Pitti Palace in Florence. She is four foot eleven and weighs 280 pounds. Okay, and uh, she is the mother of um, of, um, of Louis the Thirteenth. Um, Henry wants to build it. Paris stinks. That's the best way to put it. It stinks. I mean, the, the river has human waste in it. You can't really drink from it. There's no adequate water supply. Um, it's flooding into all these cesspits over here. It's a medieval city. And to create a capital of, of this emerging nation that he dreamed of, uh, he wanted to actually create, in fact, something which was worthy of of such a capital, to edify that term again. And we've seen this in Florence. We see this with Sixtus V in Rome. Um, and they are contemporaries. Sixtus V, 1585, um, is at the beginning of the reign of uh, Henry IV. Uh, Henry will die prematurely in uh, 1610. And will not. some of these projects will not be realized, but I want to go through the sequence of these today that were begun under Henry IV. The first of these is the Place Dauphine. Dauphine is the feminine form of, um, of um, Dauphin, Dauphin being the, the prince, Dauphine being uh, attached to the place. The place was feminine, so Dauphine, but it's actually named after his son, Louis XIV, the Dauphin. 
Um, and you'll notice that there's a new bridge. Not only have these islands that were there as like sandbars, sort of like sandbars coming down the river here, they have now been, this retaining wall has been constructed as part of a major project spanning building a new bridge. So there were only these two old bridges which had buildings on them, uh, one of which here was built by the Romans. Later, this island will actually be consolidated from a variety of smaller islands and will become the Ile Saint-Louis. Um, in the Place Dauphine, this has been consolidated, and the king wants to build a project which will be similar to the things that he has seen in Florence and in Rome. Um, and this will be the Place Dauphine. The second of these projects will be the Place Royale, which will, after uh, the revolution of 1789, will change its name, and today is known as the Place de Vosges, V-O-S-G-E-S, -E Vosges. There are other uh, protagonists in the story that come after the king, including Cardinal Armand de Plessis de Richelieu. Richelieu was an extraordinary man who, um, at the age of, of, of 18, at a very early age, had been sent as a um, papal, as an emissary of the throne of France to, um, to um, the, the papacy in Rome. And he was in Rome at the time that these sort of plans of Sixtus V were being put into place and at the beginning of the Baroque period in Rome that brought all these fountains and so forth into being um, in the city. And he returned during the minor reign of Louis XIII after the death of, um, of, of uh, Henry IV and was, in effect, the head of state. Even though they had a king, the king was 13 years old. And uh, the queen was still alive, but Richelieu is really running France. And Richelieu really set up what would become then the Bourbon monarchy as it passed on through Louis the Thirteenth and Louis the Fourteenth. Um, but as an example, he built himself a house for himself here, which today is known as the Palais Royal, but at the time was known as the Palais Cardinal. And look at where it is. It's directly opposite the Louvre. Um, there we see it in the green, the Palais Cardinal, today known as Palais Royal. Uh, with a rather, rather elaborate garden behind it, basically sending a signal to the monarchy saying, and to the nobility, saying, you know, this is how, this is the example. This is how you need to build. This is how you need to live. If you want to emerge as a, um, as a um, major player in European politics, the time, so forth, then you need to, behave that way, and that includes dressing properly, it includes proper manners, but it also includes building um, in a certain way. We see this over and over and over again. It, it's not unusual. It is not unusual in the least. Um, now, there's another one down here that we won't talk about today, but I want to mention, and that is the uh, Hotel de Luxembourg, which was built by Henry IV's queen after his death. Uh, which consolidated an old convent and some other property here um, and built the Palais de Luxembourg here. She was living out at Saint-Germain-en-Laye, way downstream and around the bend from, um, from Paris. And she moved back into the city, had her agents acquire this property, and she built uh, a palais here that was more or less based upon the design of her childhood home in Florence. Um, this will not really become significant in this course just yet, but uh, these gardens, which were built as uh, royal gardens, pleasure gardens, here and here, the Tuileries and the Luxembourg, will, after the revolution, be put into public service as public parks. And so I want to foreshadow that because we will see the way in which these new kinds of public spaces in the 19th century are begun, begin to be constructed uh, originally out of these, the confiscated grounds of the nobility, but eventually where taxes, taxes are levied um, and people are donating property and so forth uh, to create these public parks all around the, the um, industrialized world as cities begin to really grow.
Today, we want to focus on the Place Dauphine and the Place Royale and the immediate um, uh, descendants of that. The first Place Dauphine was integral to the project of the construction of this new bridge, the Pont Neuf, uh, which the king had conceived of in the late 1500s, around 1597, uh, so that um, in the engineering and construction of the bridge, they went ahead and created uh, walls, retaining walls around here, which they could then backfill, and then the insertion of this royal place. Now, this was residential. So in Italy, what we saw in Rome, for example, is that all of these obelisks uh, were associated with churches, or they were associated with other kinds of objects of antiquity, uh, but public buildings of one sort or another. Here, however, it is not associated with a public building. It is, in fact, a residential structure because he wanted to create um, a means by which he would then develop this and get the nobility to have a, quote, townhouse, a house in the city where he could keep an eye on them. So he didn't trust them all. Um, things are still kind of kind of shaky uh, politically, it's not very stable. Critical to this was a statue, an equestrian statue of the king that was to be placed here facing back as if he was keeping an eye. You know, it's like me looking at you, it's like keeping an eye on you. Um, and so an equestrian statue based upon the precedent of Marcus Aurelius at the Campidoglio in Rome um, is placed here on the Pont Neuf. The statue was manufactured in Italy and was not erected until after the king's death. This project, because of the complexities of, of engineering, actually did, was not complete uh, at the time the king passed away. Uh, but this one was, even though it started second after the Place Dauphine, the Place Royale was uh, conceived roughly at the same time, a couple of years later, but it actually opened, it was actually built before the other one because of the um, relative ease of construction in relation to all the engineering that had to be done around the Pont Neuf and um, the building up of the island. Uh, there we see then the, the alignment of the walls. These are sort of the nascent boulevards. I don't know why this is not advancing. Ah, so we'll begin with the Place Dauphine between 1578 and 1607. And there you see actually from um, the Le Grand Map of 1380, um, the islands here that were built up. This is actually then um, a huge retaining wall that is constructed around here, and a bridge, the Pont Neuf, is constructed uh, across the river here. Unlike the other bridges, the older bridges that we see in the upper part of this here, uh, these would not have buildings on them. The Pont Neuf would actually be extraordinarily wide for the time and uh, would actually contain sidewalks. All the old Roman sidewalks had been filled in, disappeared over on the left bank, and uh, this would be the first new construction uh, to actually contain sidewalks. There we actually see it as it ultimately appeared at completion with this range of residential, construct, uh, residential buildings that we see here, these townhouses, and there we see the statue of the king here in the Pont Neuf. There is that retaining wall which then consolidated the Ile de la Cité. There we see Notre Dame at the top, and this is Saint Chapelle um, that we see right here, and the uh, Hotel de Tournelle, and all these other sort of famous buildings that are constructed there on the on the island. Um, now you'll notice an odd thing about this: they couldn't quite get the um, this to be a perfect triangle. Um, and the bridge doesn't actually line up with it, and that created some problems for them um, that we'll come to in a that we'll come to in a in a moment. Uh, but notice that the parvis of Notre Dame still retains its medieval form. Today, it has been cleared all the way back to the Rue Saint Jacques. This entire area that we see here has been cleared out, as I showed you earlier. Um, so. Henry IV begins construction in 1578. Work is suspended during the religious wars and resumed 20 years later in 1598. The design is finalized in 1602. Now, the king himself did not build this. He actually turned it over to one of his ministers, his finance minister, a man named Achille Achille, Achille 
the Arlay, H-A-R-L-A-Y, and uh, Harley acted as uh, a developer, a real estate developer, actually um, capitalizing, you know, the, the land was given by the king, the royal treasury kicked in some money, he got some other investments, tried to pre-sell some of these units, never very successful, uh, but that was what actually was associated with, uh, with this. So uh, Arlay is actually now um, not the king, not the pope, but actually an agent, a person representing the interests of capital, in this case, under land that is granted by the king, acting, in effect, as a real estate developer on a speculative housing project, a speculative housing project, which was expected to make a return on the investment. Extraordinary, right? This, will, this difference between the piazzas of Rome and the royal places was likely to be on a test. You are lucky that your test is not down here and that you are here so that you know to study that. What's the difference between the piazzas of Baroque Rome and the royal places of France at the same time? Anybody? Use. One is associated with public buildings. What's the other one associated with? Residential, there you go. Domestic, very different. There's a huge difference between building a residential building up here on Peachtree Street and building a city hall or a state capitol or something like that, right? A dome for the Falcons to play in, right? Um, just one little factoid. I ought to turn this off, but one little factoid that I think is fascinating. As far as we know, between the 6th century when they finally ended, and the 7th century when they ended the games in the arena, the Colosseum in Rome, um, and um, the emergence of the modern Olympics in 1896 in Athens, Greece, there was no building constructed anywhere in the world specifically designed for a sporting event. That doesn't mean they didn't actually have sporting events. It means that there was not, they were not spectator sports. The public didn't buy a ticket to go see the game. And if we think about that in the 20th century, and we think about just starting with the Olympics, um, I mean, look at what London built <laughs> uh, for the last Olympics, right, on the east end, uncovering streams, building new venues, building stadia, building dormitories, building new housing blocks. And look at what China built before that. And then look at what Sydney, Australia built before that. Then we're back to Atlanta. What did we build? Not much. A whole bunch of dormitories on the Georgia Tech campus, a swimming pool, because that was the Georgia Tech campus was the village, the Olympic village. So what you got out of it was a swimming pool, sack, Right, which was the Olympic swimming venue. It was open air when it was built, um, and a whole lot. Otherwise, it was an Olympics in a tent. You know, uh, Turner Field, which was half of the where the Braves play, um, and that's about it. But the point being that the, we already had a lot of. I mean, look at the largest buildings on the Georgia Tech campus. What are they? Well, what's the largest building on the Georgia Tech campus? I would say it's probably Bobby Dodd Stadium, huh? Right? What's the next largest? Where do you graduate? The Camish Pavilion, right? Et cetera, et cetera. If you go to um, around the world today, there's huge amounts of capital investment being built all over the world uh, to build these sporting venues, right? Everywhere. Kuwait. London, Sydney, Brazil, wherever, uh, huge. And I think it's fascinating that um, there was this long hiatus between the 7th century and the late 19th, early 20th centuries when there were no buildings like that built. There were places, as we'll see, places where you had jousting tournaments and there were places where uh, people would gather and there were sort of these medieval fairs and so forth. But um, and bullfights, but no, nothing, you know, nothing like 
what we have today and what emerges in the 20th century. So, in any event, there are these sort of significant changes. I have no idea the significance of what I just said. I have absolutely no idea. I know that in the Middle Ages, there was a kind of competition in France between all these towns, among all these towns like Chartres and Reims and so forth, to build these great Gothic cathedrals. And there was a huge market to get a relic of a saint. If you had a relic, you know, a little finger, a skull preferably, um, you know, something that was associated, you know, that could attract people that was considered investment as what today we would call economic development, all right? And that's sort of the same thing that uh, I think we see with these sporting venues. If you really want to be a major league city, you better have what? A major league team, right? And they're willing to mortgage their children's future to get them here, right? Pretty much. Uh, okay. Um, so this is actually unusual in that it is, in fact, this residential space, but it uses these Renaissance principles of perspectival space. It's drawing upon precedents that we have seen in Italy, right down to the uh, equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius disguised as Henry IV, right? Um, so construction begins, and um, you can read this, but uh, he delivers to Ashilda Arle, the president of the parliament, uh, what amounts to about three acres, or about 1.2 hectares, for the purpose of developing a speculative residential real estate complex aimed at attracting wealthy landowners to an urban townhouse. While the model is clearly Rome and the piazza of the Campidoglio, the program is completely different. I find that very significant. Now, for the architects in here, okay, business majors, civil engineers, you don't have to worry about this. Maybe civil engineers will worry about this. Um, but um, at some point, you've got to realize if you're going to use a known geometric figure, then these two things have to be parallel, right? Or that dimension has to be different in order to get the axis to line up with the thing that you're trying to line it up with. And they, what they did is they clearly favored the geometry of the bulkhead here um, rather than, and then they tried to insert this regularized figure on the inside without expanding or contracting the depth of the buildings. And the result was they couldn't quite get it lined up. <laughs> and I find that sort of interesting. There's a simple way to have done that, which would have been simply to shift everything over. Uh, these kinds of little geometric moves are not important unless you are an architect, but they are very important if you are an architect. And we'll see what Daniel Burnham did in Washington, D.C. to disguise the fact that the mall is, in fact, two degrees off axis with the Capitol. Okay? It's fascinating. Um, so I'll, that just shows you how to do it. So here is actually the Turgo map, very famous map of 1734, showing the ensemble of bridge, statue, and plus all together. There is the bridge, there is the statue, and the statue is looking where? Back into the place. Again, the French name for piazza. Now, the none of the houses, in fact, these two that we see are reconstructions of the original buildings, uh, sort of, in a, sort of a, a reverse historic preservation. You know, they tore them down, and then they kind of built them back in order to preserve what was there originally because it's very significant. Uh, but at the end of this, at the end of the axis from the statue, from the equestrian statue, that range of buildings, whoops, this range of buildings that you see right here was actually removed and was replaced by the Supreme Court of France, the Palais de Justice, in the 19th century. But you can see here how it's catawampus, right? And today, just this grove of trees, it's all very pleasant. There's sort of cafes. Jean-Paul Sartre, the existential philosopher, lived right here. He used to spend a lot of time out there uh, writing about nothing, being and nothingness or something, right? Sitting under the trees, drinking coffee and smoking galois, I suppose. <laughs> 
And there you can actually, again, see the rotation in order to get the, the axis is a little bit of a problem. And there it is today in, um, in its final form uh, with the Palais de Justice here uh, at the end and then the two ranges of buildings. Now, you'll notice these firewalls in between, very different from what we would see in Italy where you would have basically what amounts to a Roman insula occupying an entire block or a palazzo, into, you know, taking up the whole thing here. It's divided up into individual units. More on that later because it has fairly profound urban implications. London is all this townhouse arrangement. Um, and um, the Mediterranean world is not, and Paris ends up being a kind of hybrid. If you have an insula, what can you put in ground, well, on the ground floor very easily? Anybody? Shops facing out to the street, right? How do you do that in a townhouse? I open the door, I'm inside my living room. It's not real easy. Right? It has different implications of how uh, residential and retail uses are actually combined. Uh, and it's a function of the building type. Well, as I mentioned, the second one of these planned roughly at the same time, but because of the complexities and interruptions and in the construction of the Place Dauphine, uh, the Place Royale, which uh, begins in 1605, actually opens... Um, uh, just before the king's death and is finally ready, completed for its certificate of occupancy, I suppose, in 1612. Now, it's very different. It's basically a square um, that we see here with a range of buildings with a street moving through the top. And then there is a pavillon of the queen and a pavillon of the king on either end, although neither one of them ever lived there. This is a very expensive and nice hotel. If you go to Paris, you have $380. You can actually spend the night there. Um, I've never done it. This is um, a street, though, that comes through, and then you have this ground floor arcade. Now, the scheme here, it depends on who you read, but the scheme here was to, was to create either a silk factory or a velour factory. Um, silk, most likely, and that's what the majority of historians believe. And this will coin a phrase that I will introduce now that will come into play in the 19th century, uh, quoting Lewis Mumford, out front, find silk, and in the back, tuberculosis. These were to be actually the residences of wealthy nobles, people involved in import-export, um, manufacturing, who were basically running sweatshops back here. But the scheme never actually worked out. So the silk manufacturing part of it never actually worked out. And rather, what we ended up with was this sort of residential uh, square arcaded completely on the ground floor. And this will become a precedent for Covent Garden later in London. This is the view of the Place Royale. This is now called Place de Vosges. And here it's sort of interesting architecturally because while you have the, the individual townhouse, which is given away by the fact that you have different chimneys and roofs, uh, there's an attempt here to kind of unify the facade, but the king died, they ran out of money, all this was supposed to be brick, they never could actually finish it in brick, so it's actually tooled plaster in some cases to look like brick. With this giant equestrian statue of the Dauphin, Louis XIII, there. This is actually his marriage um, in 1615. Uh, when he was something like, I guess he'd be about 18 years old at that point, or 20 years old. And you can see how these spaces were used. They were used by the nobility for these events, such as the wedding of a king. They were not open to the public in the sense that we would define that term today. The public meaning everybody. Um, at this point in time, the public meant those that were in proximity to the king. There you can actually see then the, back, the backs of these, which were intended to actually be parts of these workshops for the construction or for the manufacture, rather, of silk. There it is today. Victor Hugo, uh, the author of Les Miserables, uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, actually lived right there. And in 1980, the first time I spent any time in Paris, um, I realized one of these was for sale for $80,000. Today, that same building would cost about $4 million. 
I wish I had bought it, but I didn't have $80,000. <laughs> Pretty good investment. Um, today, of course, the ground floor arcades are art galleries and expensive restaurants and all kinds of things like that. Here, I just wanted to show it in 1931. I just like the sort of romance of that photograph. I can sort of imagine myself sitting there drinking very strong coffee or a Cote de Rhone, smoking a Galois, you know, waiting on the Germans to come or something, right? I mean, it's sort of, you know, Edith Piaf is singing in the background or something. Now, that's what it looks like today. The space is used as a public park. Uh, it's actually quite beautiful. There we see the pavilion of the Queen, now a, hotel, now a hotel, and the detail aerial photograph of it, unified in the front, but a little messy uh, in the back. Out front, fine silk, and in the back, tuberculosis. Subsequent to this, a variety of, of royal pluses would uh, continue to be built. The first is the Place de Victorie that we see here, which today is really not a plus. It's sort of a roundabout. It's just an intersection of six or seven streets coming together. The one that is significant is uh, the Place Vendôme, again here with the statue of an equestrian statue of Louis the Fourteenth. Now, if you'll notice, um, Henry the Fourth was more or less life-size. By the time of his son Louis the Thirteenth, he's a little bit bigger than life-size. By the time of Louis, Louis the Fourteenth, he's the size of this room, right? Even though in real life he was five foot four. Um, and here he is on his horse. This will ultimately be torn down uh, during the Revolution, and a column will be erected uh, by Napoleon, which guess what it looks like, the Column of Trajan. And then when Napoleon falls into disfavor and is sent into exile, uh, that column is pulled down, and then it keeps flipping back and forth. Now, the interesting thing about the... Um, and we'll get to that in a moment. But uh, the interesting thing about it, again, it's a speculative real estate um, development. So I'm going to end this today talking about this, and then we'll come back and pick up Place Vendôme and the larger point that I want to make about these royal places, okay, other than the ones I've already made. This is the Palais Cardinal built by Cardinal Richelieu. As I said, um, Hollywood has treated him poorly in stories like The Three Musketeers. He was actually an extraordinary man. Uh, brilliant, in fact, and um, actually held held things together. That's the best way I can put it, and sort of laid the, the, the groundwork for, even though he was a Roman Catholic cardinal, laid the groundwork for the emergence of the modern nation. And this was the palais, the palace that he built uh, for himself, but he built it in this Italianate style in, in a way to try to demonstrate um, the sort of proper way of, of building this to the nobility. It had a large garden in the back, and then in the early part of the 19th century, these residential wings were added a la Place de Vosges with ground floor arcades, with shops and so forth. The famous Colette lived right there. And this became then the center of Parisian society as it emerged in uh, the middle of the 19th century. Um, this was actually built by Rambuteau. There we see the gardens today with this pleached alleys. More on that later. It's an extraordinary um, um, process of pruning these. It comes from viticulture, by the way. And this is what uh, the Palais Royal looks like today. And there we see the Place de Victory at the top with all these sort of intersecting streets coming in. And then um, the Palais Royal here and the Tuileries that we see down here in the lower, lower part. Uh, so we will come back. We will end that today, and on Friday I will discuss the Place Vendôme, and then we will see the way in which, before you leave, we will see the way in which um, both these vary from the sort of larger notions that Sixtus V had, and then how in the subsequent century, in the 17th century, how André Le Note, during the reign of Louis XIV, will attempt to put all this together. And in so doing, will actually set precedents that then will carry forward into the 19th century when Baron Georges Eugène Osman and the Second Empire will remake the entire city. Okay, B's are here, A's on this end, um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way down to Z. This is M right here in the middle. <laughs>
Yeah, the, well, that's a, that, that's a very good question. But uh, part of it was that the left bank was already built out, was already developed, and so they were going over here to the right bank around the Louvre, which was royal property. So if public at that point is defined as your proximity to the king, your ability to enter into a contract as a playwright, as an artist, as a scientist, as a, you know, had to do with, with a grant from the king, right? So the king is the embodiment of the country. So your actual proximity has to do to the, to the, court, to the court of the king, actually has to do with your ability to actually do your work, right? So you want to be in close proximity. And thus, that's why Henry IV thought that he could actually attract all this nobility into the town by building these townhouses. He was wrong, right? right? Yeah. But, um, but that's what he thought, and that's why he thought it. They didn't want to be under the control of the king. France was still at this point in time. At this point in time, it, remember, it had been racked by civil war for a hundred years. And uh, they were fighting between Catholic and Protestant. Ultimately, the Roman Catholic faction would sort of win out. Um, and the Dukes of Burgundy, for example, were not, they didn't see themselves as French, right? They saw themselves as Burgundians. And, uh, and actually, they control what is now uh, Belgium, part of Belgium, Flanders. So there's a Flemish influence. If you go to Bone, which was the seats of the Dukes of Burgundy, you'll see all the roofing patterns and tiles and artwork and everything. It's all Flemish. It's amazing. So we, you know, I mean, keep in mind that, you know, the King of England for 200 years spoke French, right? So they're all fighting each other all the time. Does that make sense? Sure. So it seems like the prominence of these, uh, what do you call them, equestrian statues, basically yeah. these guys on horses, yeah. really popular. But my question is, why do they always feature the horse? Because they're trying to present this figure, obviously, like this man in some sort of godly light almost. Uh, but why the horse takes up such a amount of space in the statue, it feels like the attention is drawn to the horse rather than the figure on the horse. Well, I think in this case, it's an imitation of the statue of Marcus Aurelius. So they're all just trying to follow suit. Yeah, but why, the question is, why would he have been on a horse? He was a military commander okay. and a member of the equestrian order, the, the knights. So medieval knights came out of a class of Romans that was just under the Senate called the knights, the equestrian order, because a horse was a very expensive thing to have. And uh, you had to feed it. It's still an expensive thing to have, right? And so to have a horse in a city was a pretty... Uh, you know, um, you were somebody if you had a horse. And they formed the elements of the Roman cavalry. Now, until fairly late in the Roman world, um, until they had a professional army, you, you were responsible for your own equipment. Yeah. So, um, you, you know, the better, the better equipped you were, the better. And so if you had a horse, you were a, an officer. Okay. And it's this, I mean, you don't have tanks and yeah. trains and planes and things like we do today, you know, at this point in time. So you're still fighting on horseback. It does make a nice looking statue, but I was just wondering because, you know, the statue is such a big presence of it. This is horse. Well, look at old Matthew Brady's Civil War photographs, and you will see uh, all the soldiers out, the rifle stacked, everybody else, and then there's Sherman or somebody, Grant, yeah. on his horse, Robert E. Lee on his horse. So, um, you know, the, 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 the fact that you were on a horse indicated that you were in a, a position of command. Exactly. Simple, uh, which does make sense because now I guess we've got automobiles and horses that kind of lost that simple uh, right. of you know, dominance, so to speak. Right. Interesting. It is. But I think the, it's interesting that they were down to that one statue. The last one, yeah. And... Um, you know, it, it, it ultimately then becomes a precedent that will extend all the way up into the 20th century. I mean, you see them in front of the state capitol down here, right? Well, it's why Rome is important. Not only do we use our alphabet, but, I mean, there's everything else coming into play, too. Let me clear out of here as soon as I possibly can. Hi.